Lord, as we come together to study your word, we're so thankful for the fact that you have revealed yourself, God, that we can know you, that we can know what you're like, we can know your plan, we can know, Lord, how we can have a relationship with you, how to please you, Lord, and, and ultimately how to exalt Christ with our lives because you have revealed yourself, God. We're not purposeless in this world, but you have created us um, in your image to reflect you and to be your ambassadors and to represent you to the ends of the earth. And so we're thankful, Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us. And so as we continue to come to study your word, we pray that you would give us insight and wisdom and understanding, Lord, that uh, the more we study your word, just the, the deeper we would know you and grow to be like you, Lord. Our, our prayer, as always, is that you would change us, God, even as we talk about somewhat technical things at times, Lord, how to study your word. We talk about grammar and things like this, Lord. Our, our desire is to know you and to please you and to be like you ultimately. And so uh, we just pray that you would help us to delight in your word this morning. We pray that you'd help us to see things that we haven't seen before, myself included, God, because we believe your word is a window to see you and, and what you're like. And so as we open your word, as we think about how to study it, God, just continue to conform us to the image of Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, so once again, good morning. If you don't have a handout, grab one of those. So last time we started talking about interpretation, and we, we gave us kind of a big picture overview of what we're doing in interpreting the Bible. And we ended by talking about the different steps that you typically would go through when you're studying the Bible. And you'll remember, I mean, there's, there's just that first step of preparation, making sure our hearts are right, that we're coming to the word to be changed and not to impose our own ideas on the word. And so that's why we, obviously, we always start with prayer. We always cry out to God that he would humble us and make us teachable. Uh, but the, the first step really when, in coming to the word and, and trying to unpack it is this step of observation. And that's, we're going to spend really the next couple classes, like two or three, uh, just talking about observation. And so we're going to, yeah, just dive in and, um, sorry, I'm pulling up uh, the notes here. So the big overview is this, when we're observing, we want to slow down and observe, right? So this is before we get to the step of interpretation. That's going to come later. Um, but at this point, we're just observing. And it, it, we're going to talk a lot about the fact that we're going to be like detectives in this phase, right? We're, we're not coming up with theories yet because we're wanting to just collect all the clues. That's, that's kind of the big picture of what we're doing in observation. So the first thing is just ask questions before you come up with answers, right? Just be observing, thinking, noticing, uh, and we're going to talk about the kinds of things we're going to notice, and we're going to break it down into some categories. But that's the first idea. Slow down, right? Don't jump to conclusions. I, I think good interpretation starts with being a good observer. And so... You know, if you start coming up with theories like, oh, this is what he means, you know, before we've done enough observation, we may miss some of the clues. Does that make sense? So once again, kind of using this analogy of a detective, a good detective doesn't just walk into a room and say, oh, I know what happened, right? Uh, to do so would be to jump to conclusions, right? Because they haven't investigated all the different clues. And what, what actually ends up happening is if, you, if we come to a passage thinking we already know what it means, we're going to kind of throw out all the evidence, not on purpose, right? Not literally throw things in the trash, but in our own minds, we're going to throw out evidence that doesn't fit the conclusion that we've already come to. Does that make sense? Right? And so we just want to start by observing, right? Like, try to, I mean, we, most passages you come to, you probably already have an idea what it means. So I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying that that's invalid. I'm just saying, try to put that aside for a moment and come, I guess you could put it this way. Every time you come to the word of God, come to it fresh. Does that make sense? Come to it as if you've never read that passage before. Um, yeah, so yeah, come, come to it fresh and say, okay, well, what, is, what is the author saying here? Let, let's just start observing. Now, I'm talking about, too, there's, there's different ways that we could approach the Bible, too. So sometimes 
we're just reading the Bible. Let's say we're doing our yearly Bible plan and we're just reading it, um, you know, whole books of the Bible at a time. You're just kind of reading through the Bible. Maybe you don't have a lot of time. Um, you know, that's okay too, where you're not really trying to interpret the text so much. It's just kind of like sit in it, read a lot, um, just familiarity with the Bible and the Bible stories. So that's great too. But if you're really like, hey, I'm going to study this passage. I want to understand what it means. That's a little bit more what we're talking about here. So um, when we're doing that, you're, you, you have your passage that you're studying. You just want to read it and observe it. And what, you know, sit with kind of like meditate on the passage before you come to conclusions. Uh, because once you form those conclusions, it can be hard to change, you know, change your ideas. Now, once again, Going with this detective analogy a little bit further, a good detective tries to understand what happened and why. Are you with me? And that's why this analogy is actually a pretty good analogy, because we're not just trying to figure out what Paul said. We're trying to figure out why Paul said it. Does that make sense? So that, that we would call that motive, right? If you ever watch crime shows, they're always after the motive, right? Um, so we don't always use that word in studying the Bible. We could talk about intent which is basically the, a synonym, right? So we talk about authorial intent. What's, what's the motive for the author writing? And so just like a, a detective, you, you come to a crime scene and there could be multiple different interpretations of what happened based on the facts. The, the facts may even seem to contradict one another. But in a crime scene, you know something happened. Are you with me? Right? So whatever the evidence is, whether it's somebody got framed and somebody put a gun in somebody's hand or whatever, like it may look like one thing, but one thing actually happened in that room. You, you tracking with me? And it's the same way with interpretation, right? Paul, when he wrote, he meant something, right? And he said what he said for some reason. There's not multiple different things that happened there. He, he was thinking something and that's reflected in the words that he wrote. And so all the facts properly understood point to the correct interpretation. Does that make sense? Now, there could be facts that seem really relevant, but aren't. Just, just like in a crime scene, you could be like, oh, that's really, no, it's, it's just, that's just how it was. It wasn't significant. So that's good. That's why a good detective, we're just kind of looking for clues. Um, and so our goal is to, to put it back into the analogy of um, interpreting the Bible and not being a detective, our goal is to figure out not how all the clues relate, but how all the words relate to each other. Are you with me? And how they fit into the overarching meaning of the passage. Okay, so once again, good detective, you start, you start by just noticing everything, just collecting evidence, if you will, right? You put it all in your evidence bags. And you then add, over time, you'll start to piece together a correct uh, like we could call it a coherent and a cohesive picture of what happened. So good detective, ask tons of questions, chase down every lead. And only then will you start to kind of weed out answers that aren't relevant and, and come to a conclusion about what is the correct interpretation. But the, the kind of the, the goal here is stay open to as many different interpretations as, as long as possible, so to speak. Um, because we're, we're just observant. We're just noticing. Are everyone clear what we're talking about so far? So we haven't gotten into it. Like, what are we looking for? But we're just starting with like noticing. And if you're taking the class for credit, um, you know, I'll give you an assignment where it's like, you get some passage. I remember pretty much every seminary class has you do this. It gives you like a passage of a few verses. Okay. Write down a hundred observations on those three verses. And you're like, no, that's impossible. You know, but actually the more you sit with it, you just notice things. And there's actually, I, I heard of a biology class that did the same thing. Like it was like a, I can't remember, like a graduate level biology class or something. And they gave, everyone got like a dead fish. And they're like, write down 500 observations on this fish or whatever, right? And people are like, we'll never be able to do this. It's a, it's a dead fish, right? But, you know, you just sit and start noticing. It's like, wait a minute, I noticed that this, the scales are like this or the gills are like, and you just start over time, it's like, wow. And by the end of that, you really know that fish, right? Uh, does that make sense? So that's kind of the same idea with the word. If you're really in a passage, you're just thinking and noticing, observing. There, if you just sit with it for a while, you're going to get to know that passage. You're going to notice all kinds of things about it. 
Okay? Um, so the second part of the, the overview here is read, right? <laughs> How do we do observations of the Bible? We read the Bible. And so I just say, read it, read it, read it. Um, now, every book, every passage that, of the Bible that we're looking at, we talked about this last time, it's part of a book, right? And, and so much, we talked about this last time, we're trying to understand how our passage fits into the purpose of the book as a whole, right? And so, so much of interpreting any one passage is understanding the book it's in. And so, uh, you really can't master Romans 5 without knowing quite a bit about Romans and the argument of Romans or whatever the passage may be. Does that make sense? So I would just say, read that book over and over. I mean, try to read through the whole, whole book in one sitting at times. You know, you don't always have to do that, but read large sections. Try to understand the flow of thought. See the big picture. Look for connections between, wait, this paragraph and this paragraph, this section and this section. How are they connected? What are key themes that run through the whole thing? Repeated ideas. And just the section in particular that you're studying, just read it over and over and over. Um, I would say read it in a bunch of different translations right? Um, most of us don't know Hebrew or Greek or whatever, and so we have our English translations, which are good translations. Um, and, you know, we'll talk more about translations as we go, but none of the translations are perfect, right? None, they all have different purposes. Some, we talked about this, I think, last time as well, or the time before. Some of the quote-unquote more literal translations, we call them formal equivalency translations, they try to keep the exact word for word of the original. And that, that helps us to notice some things about the structure of the text. But in doing so, they can be overly literal and miss like the overarching meaning of the text, right? And so some of the less literal translations sometimes do a better job of translating the, the idea that the author's trying to get across. So that's why it's helpful to read more literal translations and less literal. They both have value. They both have a purpose. Um, probably my favorite translation for reading, you know, getting in depth and doing Bible studies, it's a new one called the Legacy Standard Bible. It's, it's very literal. It's based off the NASB. Um, so it, it, they did some, some things in their translation that I really like, but, it's not, but just because you have a favorite translation doesn't mean that that's the only one you should read. Read, read a bunch of the trans. I, I, all the translations I listed there, um, the Berean Literal Bible, the Legacy Standard, the NA New American Standard, the English Standard, the Berean Study Bible, the, um, the CSB and the HCSB are both uh, Southern Baptist translations, and then NIV, NAT, NET, NLT. Those are all good translations, okay? So, I mean, in English, we have such a wealth of translations. So pick, you don't have to read every single one of those, but pick a couple, maybe a couple more literal, maybe one less literal. And if you're studying a passage, read them. Notice any differences. Just let it, let it sit with you for a while. And I would say sometimes it's helpful to not just read it, but listen to it, right? Maybe an audio book or maybe read it out loud to yourself. Sometimes doing that will cause you to notice things that you didn't notice when you were just reading it, books, you know, words on a page. So the, the goal here is just to saturate yourself in the word. So when we're talking about observing, that's what we're talking about doing, just taking in the word, sitting in it, observing it. Okay, any questions before we, we get into the details? All right, so we're going to break down, like I said, we're going to spend weeks just talking about observation because this, you know, if you're a good detective, finding all the clues, what kind of clues are you looking for, that's the main idea. And then I should also say, if, you, if you're reading, you know, take note of any observations. Maybe you have like a little journal or notebook along with you. Um, if you're, you know, going to be studying some passage in depth, just start taking notes. Maybe it's in the margin of your Bible, whatever. Oh, circling words, highlighting words, drawing arrows between words, things like that. that, that that's, you know, so that when you come back, you're like, wow, look at all the things I've noticed about this passage. Okay, so the first thing we're going to observe is the context. Okay, so we, we talked about this a little bit, but context is just super important for understanding the meaning of the text. So... This is true at the sentence level, the paragraph level, the section level, the book level, right? That whatever, if we're talking, I want to know the meaning of this word in this sentence, or I want to know the meaning of this sentence 
in the paragraph or this paragraph in the section or this section in the book, right? The context you could talk about is the home of your text. Are you with me? So some word, it's not just some random word out of the dictionary. It's a word in a sentence, right? So the sentence in that case would be the context for that word. Um, and that's, this is important, of course, because every sentence, let's just talk about sentences. Every sentence is part of an argument, part of a flow of thought, part of, it's not just some random sentence out there. Like, I mean, you'll see, I mean, maybe you've seen that, like words of wisdom, put it on your wall, just put a, a verse up there. You know, there may be some great truth there that you can, you know, kind of this principle for living or whatever it may be, some great verse. But that verse wasn't written just to be put on a wall. It was part of a letter. It's part of a book. It has a context. It has, so it's part of some argument or some flow of thought. Are you with me? And so the context is we're noticing everything except for what we're studying. <laughs> Does that make sense? So it's like, I want to study this verse. We'll start by studying everything around it. Okay. So, um, some people have, have said context is king in terms of meaning because that's how highly they say that's how important the context is for understanding the meaning. I'd probably demote context just a little bit and say it's queen. <laughs> you know, like, uh, so the way you could think of it is like this. Words have meaning, right? Grammar, it has meaning. Uh, just talking about a word, we've talked about some of these examples before. We're going to get into words a lot more, but like the word bank, we keep using that example. Are we talking about place to go get money? We're talking about the bank of a river, okay? Words have broad meanings. The context limits it, but the context can't make that word mean whatever you want it to mean. Does that make sense, right? So the context can, can limit the meaning. It can alter the meaning. You could, you know, without the context, the meaning is usually broad and ambiguous. The context narrows us in. But I, I, I like saying context is queen because I don't want us to get this idea that context can make words mean whatever you want them to mean. Does that make sense? It, it's very important because a word out of context, it can mean all kinds of different things. It can be misconstrued in a lot of different ways, but meaning sentences make sense in context. Okay, but the meaning of words and the grammar, those are kind of like, that gives you like, this is what it could mean. And then the context limits it and zeroes it in. It's like, oh, this is clear. Y you with me? So a lot of times if you're trying to understand some sentence, there are some difficult sentences to understand. But then when you get the you're reading it in the flow of that paragraph or that book, all of a sudden it's like, oh, everything he's the you know, the things he's saying here are related to the things he said earlier, right? It's, he's already in a flow of thought. So he's not just giving us some original idea in this one verse. And so now when I read it in context, okay, now it makes sense. Does that, does that make sense? So context is just kind of the, the home. Like another way you could put it is this, um, you know, context is like everything around the text itself. So you know, we could t going back to the detective theme, if you find a knife laying next to a dead body, that has kind of some suggested ideas versus a knife that's in the kitchen, right? It's like same knife, different context. You with me? It's like, oh, I I'm looking, this is, this knife is like very different purposes immediately come to mind. Or another way to do it is, I, I don't know if you like archaeology, but archaeologists, they're always like, they're digging in the dirt, right? And they're finding pottery. They're finding, you know, all kinds of ancient weapons or whatever their the houses that they're digging up or whatever. But let's say you find some artifacts, some really, you know, significant artifacts. Um, I don't know what it may be, but let's say it's a, let's say it's like a, a silver amulet or something like that, right? Well, you can learn a lot about that just from looking at the amulet. But where you find it, that's huge to archaeologists, right? That could tell you a lot about like, well, wait a minute, who owned this amulet? Or what time period or what city or what culture? I mean, man, archaeologists, they, they talk about, they have this whole phrase in situ for like, that means uh, an artifact that's found in its home situation. It wasn't like disturbed and ripped out of context and like, oh, here, archaeologists, here's this amulet. It's like, no, why did you, you shouldn't have taken it out of its home. Like, I want to find it in its home because that tells me so much about it. So that's kind of the same idea with the text. 
right? It's like, I don't want to take my text out of its home and just look at it by itself. I want to see it in its context, okay? Um, so in the context, we've broken down the kinds of context that, once again, we're just going to start by observing. And the first type of context, we're just going to call the general context. And this is maybe in some ways the most important. This is who wrote and to whom. Like kind of, so this, this letter, this book of the Bible, it's written by an author to an audience, right? And so just understanding the relationship between the author and the audience, and that is, that's the first piece of information that we really want to understand well when we're coming to a book. So who wrote this book and what was their background? So, I mean, if you're studying the book of Amos, okay, he's a farmer. He likes to use farming analogies. Uh, you could see that in 714. He wasn't, like a lot of the prophets, they were, they went to the school of the prophets. They kind of grew up as prophets, so to speak, and learned. But Amos, he's like, I'm just a farmer. And God, like, hey, I want you to go talk to my people. You with me? That, that's his, <coughs> excuse me, that's his background, right? And that once again, it may be relevant, it may not, you know, when you're, um, when you're reading and studying through the book of Amos, but that's, just, once again, it's a clue. Okay, this is who this man was who wrote this book. David, obviously, we know who David was. He was a shepherd. He was a king. He was a poet. You know, he was a songwriter. And, you know, the fact that he wrote certain psalms is very significant, right? When you're studying Psalm 51, right? What is the first verse? It's when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in with Bathsheba, right? So that's, that's extremely important when you're studying Psalm 51, isn't it? Like knowing, wait a minute, David committed adultery with Bathsheba, and he's writing this psalm in response, in a, you know, about that situation, in response to that situation. Man, that's, we love it when the Psalms have a little title like that, that give us that background information, because now that, that kind of colors the whole thing. You with me? And then the whole thing is about, you know, he starts off, have mercy on me, O God. Why is he saying that? Because he sinned, right? And you would want to, if you're really studying Psalm 51, go back and read the account with David and Bathsheba, right? Um, you know, understand, kind of get in his mind, in his shoes, like what happened and how Nathan had to confront him. If you just took off that first part of the verse, you know, and just started, I mean, you would understand Psalm 51, but it would lose a lot of kind of the, the flavor to it of why the author's saying this, where he, what he's getting at. Are you with me? Just how thankful David is for God's forgiveness. Another really important uh, psalm to know the authorship, right? Just starts off with Psalm 110, a psalm of David. That's, that's it. That's the background. But notice, this is, I mean, this becomes just a laser-focused text in the New Testament that gets quoted a lot. Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay, just, just stop right there for a second. Wait, who wrote that? David. Okay, if David wrote it, then he's the one speaking. So wait a minute. Yahweh, we know who that is, that's God, says to another person, my Lord. Who's Lord? David's Lord. Wait a minute. Okay, now this is pretty important. We got Yahweh, David. We got another person in this text, don't we? We have David's Lord. David is the king, isn't he? So who could be David's Lord? <laughs> That's why this text is so important. This is the Messiah. That's what we start, and, and this is why this text gets quoted over and over about Jesus as proof of his divinity and, and lordship, right? Because, because of the authorship of this psalm. If you didn't have that psalm, if somebody else said this, it wouldn't mean that much, right? Because if, if I said, you know, uh, Yahweh says to my Lord, my Lord could be, you know, well, I'm not in the kingdom, but if I had a king, right, it could be my king, right? But David was the king, so his Lord is obviously above him, okay? So the authorship, right, it makes, make, he's, so in other words, the me or the I or the my in this text is David because he's the author. Are you with me? All right, other examples. Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon, okay? That's super important, um, 
You know, we see that right in the first, it doesn't use his name, but the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And you go through Ecclesiastes, what is it all about? What? Life, wisdom. wisdom. More specifically, the, the emptiness or the vanity of life. That's how he starts off. Vanity of vanities, everything's empty. And he goes through the whole book talking about how I tested this, I tried that, I couldn't find satisfaction in building gardens or chasing after women or money or fame. Or Now, if regular old Joe wrote this book and they, let, they say, man, I chased after money and power and whatever, and it wasn't satisfying. Somebody could just say, well, you just didn't have enough power. You didn't just have enough money. If you just had a little bit more, then you could have found satisfaction. But this was Solomon, the richest man on the earth, right? It, when he said he chased after women, he's talking about thousands, right? When he talks about chasing after money, he had literally tons of gold, right? And so he's the one that's saying all of this is emptiness, right? Wow, that's super significant, isn't it? Right? Of like who wrote this and what they mean. Or you could look at the Song of Solomon, right? Also written by Solomon, but I I would suggest earlier in life, right? And it's kind of this love song to his first wife, um, which later obviously becomes a little bit ironic, doesn't it? When, when he has all these different wives, but I think this was probably written early in his life. And when like the first uh, woman that he married, the Shulamite or Shunammite woman. So anyway, I'm not going to get into all of Song of Songs here, but um, man, the fact that Solomon wrote it uh, influences a lot of how we interpret and look at these books, right? So the author, obviously we want to know the author. Who are they? You know, Paul, Peter, New Testament authors. You got to start by just who is this guy? You with me? Um, next is who is he writing to? So this is, ob- this is obvious stuff, right? Who's the author? Who are they writing to? So what were they like? So first of all, do they have any relevant, like the, the recipients, we'll just call them that, the people that are receiving this book, do they have any relevant history? So for example, if you look at the first five books of the Bible, sometimes called the Pentateuch or the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, um, you know, do they have any relevant history? So you look at the Torah, what, who was Moses writing to? <clears throat> to what? The people of Israel. That's good. But what, the more you study the Torah, guess what? We can narrow that down a little bit. It's actually the second generation of people that were redeemed from Egypt, right? So we, if you read through the Torah, you, you know, you start with, Adam and Eve, and you kind of follow through the whole history. You get to the people of Israel growing in Egypt, and then God saves them out of Egypt, right? And what happens? They, you know, the 10 plagues, parting of the Red Sea, they go to Sinai, and God reveals the law to them. I mean, it's all going well. And then God says, go to the promised land, and they say, nope, too big, too scary. Ten, the 12 spies, everyone remember this, right? So what happens? God's like, and then, so God's like, all right, you're going to die in the wilderness. You're going to wander for 40 years. Then they're like, no, we'll go. And God's like, nope, too late, right? So they try to go on their own. They get beat down. And so like, yeah, I said, you're going to go to the wilderness. You're going to go to the wilderness. So they go in the wilderness and what happens? The whole first generation dies in the wilderness, don't they? Okay. Then the second generation are the ones to whom, as they're standing on the brink of the promised land, their parents, they grew up in the wilderness. Their parents died in the wilderness. That's the audience of the Torah. I mean, and God, you know, Moses is writing to them and saying, in some ways, don't be like your parents. This is who your God is. This is who you are as a nation. This is my plan for you. If you trust me and follow me, you'll be blessed. And he lays out the whole plan. You with me? But once again, that second generation, their history, our parents died in the wilderness, but now we have a chance. Are we going to obey God? You with me? That's the audience. And the book of Joshua talks about, man, they went in, they conquered the land. They, they followed God. Okay. So, um, you know, just even that little differentiation is written to the people of Israel, but when, oh, this is the second generation that, that brings in a lot of relevance for understanding the Torah. Uh, once again, it's not a Torah class, but just trying to get into all these different um, examples of how these things are relevant. Um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on. Second Corinthians, <laughs> man, Paul had a history with the Corinthians, right? It's not the first letter he wrote to them. And actually, he wrote more letters to the Corinthians than we even have in our Bibles. There's the severe letter, which was lost, right? And we don't know what happened to it. I mean, you could talk, I mean, you, if you're reading Second Corinthians, you'll notice Paul talks about his previous writings to them, like in 7, 8, for even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, right? I mean, he wrote them this harsh letter. It saddened them, right? He says that it, the letter grieved you for only for a while, and ultimately it caused them to repent, right? By this kind of harsh letter that he wrote, calling them to repentance, and they, they took it to heart, right? And then and he talks about, you know, I don't want to appear frightening with my letters. They're like, oh, he writes strong letters, but when he's in person, he's pretty weak sauce, and, you know, and he's like, no, I'm going to be bold. I'm coming. And anyway, there, there's a whole history, right, between Paul and the Corinthians. If you're studying Second Corinthians or even First Corinthians, man, you'd want to know that history. And that's the kind of the context in which this letter is written. Um, what's, what's going on in the letter? Like, what's the situation? So once again, author, recipients, who are the recipients? But then what's going on? So in the book of First John, we already talked, we keep coming back. This is such a great example because we have this kind of context of, that's pretty clear. There's heresy spreading in the church and John is writing to address that heresy. We, we talked about this, right? Um, you know, he talks about, this is the one who came by water and the blood, right? Apart from any context, we're like, what does that mean that Jesus came by? And once again, there's tons of interpretations, but if you understand the background and the specific heresy that Jesus was just a man, he, you know, we, we talked about the specific heresy we find out from the church fathers was that the divine Christ descended on the man Jesus at his baptism and left right before his death. That's a heresy, right? Because it's saying that the man Jesus was just a man and the divine son of God just kind of like descended on him like the Holy Spirit comes on us. You with me? And, and that spares God from the travesty of being born because that's unthinkable. And how could God die? And so that, that heresy spares God from being born and having to die. Okay, so, but John is saying, no, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Son of God came through the water and the blood. Okay, he's the one that was born. He's the one that, that also died. Okay, so anyway, the background really helps us to see that. 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they weren't really of us because if they would have been with us, they would have continued with us. All right, these are people that left the church because of false teaching, right? And they have chased after this false teaching. So that's what's going on. And that's what, and John addresses a lot. Like if you say that, if you deny that Jesus is the Christ, you're the antichrist, right? He says all kinds of things like this because he's, he's dealing with this situation. Uh, Jonah, okay, we, we all love the book of Jonah, right? It's this great story of this prophet who rebels and who, you know, ultimately gets swallowed by the whale and um, all the rest. So, um, you know, but what was going on that, that Jonah wrote this book? Well, we actually find out, if you go to Second Kings, it's talking about, um, oh, which king is it? It's Jeroboam II, and it talks about he restored the border of Israel from Libo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of Yahweh. Sorry, I got to turn this off. It's just beeping its little head off. Um, so, you know, it talks about how he restored the border, right? Which he, and then it says, according to the word of Yahweh, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai. Hey, who's that? That's Jonah, right? So what do we find out about the people of Israel just from this verse is the context for the book of Jonah. Well, who's the king when Jonah's prophesying? Jeroboam the second. Anyone know about Jeroboam II? Do a little bit of research. He's a really wicked king. He's named after Jeroboam I. Jeroboam I was the king of Israel that set up the high places in Dan and Beersheba. No, no, Dan and um, Bethel, right? In the two, the north and the south of his kingdom so that the people wouldn't worship God in Jerusalem. And he set up these idolatrous golden calves and he set up this whole idolatrous worship system in the north. 
That's why the northern kingdom, they never worshiped Yahweh. None of the kings were good. They were all bad all the time because Jeroboam the first, when the kingdom split, he's like, I don't want you going to Jerusalem. I don't want you going down to those southerners, right? So I'm going to put my own worship system in place so you don't worship God in Jerusalem because that would just draw you back to the southern kingdom. You with me? So from the beginning, Jeroboam the first, he set up this idolatrous system and, and all the kings of Israel were wicked. Some were worse than others, but they, none of them got rid of that system. And Jeroboam the second, he was headlong into the sins of his, his namesake, Jeroboam the first. And so super wicked, but then 2 Kings 14 also tells us what? They were, this was actually a really prosperous time in Israel's reign. I mean, he reigned for a long time. You could see that. And you can see he expanded the borders. So that is super relevant for the book of Jonah. Anyone know, if you're going to give you a single word, what's the main theme of the book of Jonah? One word. What's that? Forgiveness? Yeah, that's close. Yeah, I, I would use the word compassion, which is related, right? So the whole book of Jonah is like God has compassion on people. That's why he saves people, right? Okay, now that's extremely relevant, isn't it? Because now we know it was written to people who were what? Rich and happy, right? And just in their wickedness and, and happy and complacent and, and rich, right? You with me? And doing well and, and yet not following God. And the book of Jonah is really written to confront them, obviously for their sin, but specifically for their kind of self-righteous, we're doing great, we're good, we, we don't care about anybody else, right? So that background gives us, why, why is he writing this? Now, the, that the theme of Jonah is compassion. You don't need to know the background of Jonah to get that, do you? I mean, the very last verse of the book is like, I had com- you had compassion on the plant, Jonah, how could you not have compassion on Nineveh, this city? Like, so it's very explicit in the book that the main theme is compassion. But now we see the flavor that he's getting at when we hear the audience, right? Oh, they were rich. They were complacent. They were wicked. You with me? Now we could see how that message of compassion is so relevant. It doesn't change the meaning of the book, but it helps us to understand what the author's really going for. Does that make sense? Okay, so once again, we're just tons of examples. Because I I think, you know, we could talk all the time about, you know, some of these principles, but I think when we see how they're relevant in different books of the Bible, it just hopefully will just help it. Oh, now I see how that background helps us. Uh, The book of Hebrews, okay? Anyone know what was going on in the book of Hebrews that the author wrote the book? That's right. Yeah, Jews that were on the verge of rejecting Jesus, going back to Judaism. Anyone know why they were doing that? What's that? Yeah, there was some maybe leaders involved, but there's kind of a situation. Yeah, they were being persecuted, right? And the Christians were being persecuted, but the Jews weren't, right? So Judaism obviously had been a kind of quote-unquote official religion within the Roman Empire for decades by this time, right? Christianity was somewhat new, right? And so, you know, some of the Roman emperors started blaming Christians for stuff, and, you know, they're this new religion they outlawed, and they started persecuting the Christians, but they weren't persecuting the Jews. Man, if you're a Jewish Christian that's accepted Jesus as the Messiah, that presents you with a very tantalizing, like, temptation, right? All I have to do, I can still worship God, quote unquote. All I got to do is leave off that Jesus part. I'll just stick with my Old Testament. I don't need the New Testament. The New Testament wasn't even written. All I have to do is like not add the name Jesus, you know, to it, so to speak, right? So that's what they were tempted with. And the whole book is written, don't forsake Jesus. He's the whole point of the Old Testament, right? It's all about him. It, there's no other salvation. All the, all the sacrifices in the Old Testament, they were just pointing to the ultimate sacrifice. So once Jesus has come, if you reject Jesus, you're rejecting God. Right? I mean, that's the whole argument of the book. You with me? But it helps us to understand the background. Like they're being persecuted. And so they were beat down. They weren't rejecting Jesus because, you know, for pleasure. 
right? That would be, a, I mean, people do that too, but they were rejecting Jesus because they were getting persecuted for Jesus. And so this book has a lot of, I mean, you just if you read the book of Hebrews, you'll see there's so much exhortation, right? He's pleading with them, but there's also just so much encouragement. You with me? Because these believers were beat down. They're persecuted. And you can see this all throughout the book, right? He's like, you had compassion on those in prison, right? Christians are literally being thrown in prison for being Christians. And he's like, yeah, you're doing a good job. He's encouraging them, right? He's like, in your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted the shedding of blood. You've only been thrown in prison, right? You haven't died yet, so keep on going. I mean, that's a, I mean, it's a tough message, right? But that's, but, but once again, the context of Hebrews is like, oh, this whole letter is written to these beat down, discouraged, persecuted Christians. Hold on to Jesus. Okay, that background just, man, you read the book of Hebrews in that light. It helps so much to see why he's saying what he's saying. Does that make sense? Uh, what other examples we got? James, right? I mean, similar Jewish believers. So, but this was very early persecution. They were scattered. So he writes, um, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, right? And uh, he writes, you know, in that context. Okay, I'm going to keep moving on. Okay, what was the relationship between the author and the audience? So who's the author? Who's the audience? What were each of them like? What was going on, you know, that the letter was written to? And was there any relationship between the author and the audience? Obviously, Moses, (laughs) you know, when he writes to the people of Israel, you got some history, right? I mean, um, I love how he ends Deuteronomy, right? For I know how rebellious and stubborn you are. I mean, obviously they got some history going on there. And he's like, um, he's like, behold, even today while I'm alive with you, you have been rebellious against Yahweh. How much more after my death? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's because of some history, right? They've been rebelling against him. And so he's trying to, I mean, so much of the Torah, he's trying to wake them up. He's trying to shake them out of their complacency. And I mean, he's being pretty bold, right? Because they're so forgetful and stubborn. Jeremiah, man, you read that book. That guy was thrown in the pit. He was put in stocks. He was, I mean, and and so the whole book starts off with God saying to Jeremiah, hey, Jeremiah, I'm going to make you like a fortified wall. I mean, that sounds great except for when you remember fortified walls are needed because of sieges, right? So he was attacked his whole life. Like I said, just thrown into the pit and, and God's like, you know what? You're just going to prophesy and these people are never going to listen to you. And that's Jeremiah's life. That's the whole book of Jeremiah. He keeps prophesying. I mean, there's a lot that Jeremiah says. It's a big book, but in short, it's like repent and go out to the king of Babylon. Don't fight against him. And what do they do? They're like, really, Jeremiah? That doesn't make sense to me. I think we'll like, oh, I I mean, I think we'll fight against him. Because he keeps saying like, just surrender, man. Just surrender. Babylon's coming. And they keep, I mean, it's, it's crazy, the book of Jeremiah. Like the book ends where the Babylonians come in and absolutely decimate the city. I mean, destroy the temple. I mean, you could read about it in Lamentations. It's horrific, right? And even then the people are like, hey, Jeremiah, what should we do? He's like, go submit to the Babylonians. And they're like, ah, I don't think so, Jeremiah. Let's go to Egypt. And he's like, are you kidding me? Right? So they flee to Egypt and God's like, you know what? I could still get you there. And so he, you know, keeps going after him even while they're in Egypt, right? So, I mean, the whole book is just this relationship between Jeremiah and the people. And like, he's just keeps proclaiming the truth and they keep won't, not listening, right? That, that's the content. That's the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So am, am I reading like of the Old Testament, especially around, around that time? Like I, I found it just super helpful, uh, just how a lot of the, the, the prophetic books, the, the books of the prophet, how they start with, uh, when they prophesied mm-hmm. during the reign of this king and this king. And so you can kind of go back to Kings and Chronicles mm-hmm. and read what happened when those people were ruling. Mm-hmm. And then when you go back and read, you know, the prophets, it makes sense like what they're talking about. Because, you know, um, I think God said a lot about just putting your trust in, 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 in Pharaoh and all that. And so knowing, you know, what happened in, in Kings and Chronicles and what they did, it helps you understand why he was even saying that. And so, yeah, just in my personal just growth, you know, when I when I saw that, you know, I was like, yeah, like, and that, so I've read Kings and Chronicles several times because 
you know, it always has me going back to comb through the stuff that I missed, but just that, you know, it's super helpful that the books start like that. Yeah. Yeah. Almost all the prophets, you know, even if they don't have a prophetic introduction like that, like during the King of, like Jonah doesn't, but he's in Second Kings and we could find him. So there's only a couple, like Obadiah, there's a lot of debate about when it was written, you know, there's a couple others that are a little bit, but almost all of them, like you said, you could figure out exactly when they're written, what's the background, what's going on. So yeah, you're exactly right. All right. Um, Paul, obviously we can look at Paul's letters, man, the, the letter to the Philippians, he had a great relationship with the Philippians. I mean, he talks about him. The, the letter of Philippians is almost like a thank you letter to them. Like, man, thank you guys for supporting me and supporting my mission. And it's so full of just joy and thankfulness. And now he does a right to address a, an issue between Yodia and Syntyche. And he wants to make sure that division doesn't crop in within the church. But for the most part, the Philippian church, they supported and loved Paul. They had a partnership, right? Um, he talks about, you know, you know, Philippians, when I left Macedonia, no church, you know, entered into partnership with me and giving, receiving, except you only. Like, you're the only church that kept sending me money over and over again to support my mission, right? So very positive, right? On the other hand, the Corinthians, right? He didn't have such a great relationship with them. They're rejecting his apostleship. They're arguing with them. So once again, when you're reading these different books, it's like, Oh, Philippians has quite a different tone than Corinthians. Why is that, right? I mean, and you could get into that history and background. Um, I mean, in Corinthians, he literally says, some of you are arrogant as though I was not coming to you, but I will come soon. <laughs> I mean, you could just, the whole tone's different, right? And he's like, uh, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod? <laughs> That's pretty strong language, isn't it? Or with a spirit of gentleness. Now, I mean, I love, I mean, even in Corinthians, he is gentle. He is caring. He obviously cares about them and he's, but he definitely raises his tone a little bit with them. Are you with me? Out of love, you know, to, to say, hey, this is serious. You know, this isn't something to be trifled with, but it's always in love. And he, there's very loving, compassionate things in these books as well, but it's just a different audience, different tone. Um, yeah, we really talked about this. He's like, I don't want to appear frightening to you with my letters, you know, um, but he, he does kind of raise the tone a little bit. Um, obviously, Paul with Timothy and Titus, his sons in the faith. I mean, we want to talk about the closest relationships, especially with Timothy. I mean, but Titus as well. These are his, these, you know, those letters are not written to a church at, as a whole as much as to these men who he discipled and poured his life into. So, man, there's just a different kind of flavor to it. That's why we call them the pastoral epistles. Um, talks about Timothy, my true child in the faith. Same thing, my true child in a common faith. Um, Luke, who is he writing to? This Roman official who is likely his patron. In other words, the guy who funded, I mean, Luke Acts, that's a massive book, Right? He had to take off serious time to research and to write those, right? Somebody, somebody paid for that. And most likely it's Theophilus, the guy who, you know, the introduction. That was a very common thing in those days. If, you know, this, this whole system of patronage, you could read about this, you know, in the Roman world, like rich people, what did they, what did they do often? They would pay people to do works of art or literature or whatever. Why? Because then they would kind of get the glory for it and, you know, and it'd be dedicated to them because they're the patron. And anyway, that even Luke uses that word of patronage in the gospel of Luke. It's kind of interesting. The other gospel writers don't do that. But uh, anyway, so he's this Roman official. We could talk about, um, you know, the whole point of Luke Acts, part of it was apologetic as Luke is showing the beauty of Christianity and showing that Christianity isn't just this random cult that some dude started, right? Christianity that Paul was preaching because this Roman official, like how did Christianity, we're, we're in Acts, right? So how did Christianity spread through the Roman world? Paul, went around, planted churches, right? Spread the gospel. So everybody knows who Paul is. He's this guy. And so the gospel that reached all these different places, even getting to Rome, right? It's from Paul. Well, where did this guy come up with it? Well, he got it from Jesus and, and he's connected to, I mean, 
Paul and Peter, there's, there's this connection to Jesus who's connected to the Old Testament. So Luke is kind of telling the whole story where Christianity comes from, how Christianity is actually selfless and good for society because it makes us like Jesus. And it's not about just an insurrection against Rome, you know, but it's about love and, and, and the gospel, right? So he's, he's like, God's kingdom is not of this earth, right? Jesus says, otherwise my servants would come and fight. And so anyway, like understanding who he's writing to and why, man, okay, this may, the whole book starts to make a lot more sense. You, you tracking with me? Um, in this case, I believe Luke, you know, wasn't just, he didn't, like, obviously, Theophilus, as his patron, he didn't pay him to write these two books just for him, right? So it's not like, um, you know, Theophilus got them and, like, stored them in his closet and never shared them. Like, if he's going to pay someone to write these two books, it's for other people to read as well. But in that sense, Theophilus is his primary audience. And, you know, anyone else who reads it is kind of fitting within that uh, context. So same thing with Timothy and first, second Timothy and Titus, they're written to them, but there's little clues within the book. When Paul is writing to, for example, Timothy, and he's telling them about the church, he's intending for Timothy to read this before the church, which kind of gives Timothy some authority, doesn't it? Like, hey, this isn't what I'm saying. This is what the apostle Paul says. Let me tell you what, what he told me the church should be structured like, right? And like the requirements for elders, for example, or Titus is like, Paul tells Titus, hey, I want you to appoint elders in every city. They have to have these qualifications. Well, Titus is kind of to lead that, but guess what he's going to do is he's appointing elders and building these churches. You got to read the letter that Paul sent and they're going to see, okay, Titus has this authority kind of delegated from Paul. And you, know, you see what I'm saying? So it's, it's meant to be read at a right, at a, as a wider audience. And there's, there's evidence that things that Paul says in the pastoral epistles are to kind of give Timothy and Titus some, some weight to them. Does that make sense? Um, anyway, but so just kind of think about the audience. Another question is, okay, so the author is writing to the audience how did they learn what they're writing about? Does that make sense? So, um, for example, Moses, when he writes the Torah, how did Moses know what to write for Genesis 1? Right? He wasn't there, guaranteed, right? Well, Moses talked face-to-face -face with God. So that's where he got a lot of his information from. You with me? Um, you, you could see that in Exodus 33, 11. It's just that grace, great verse. Moses would speak face to face as a man speaks with his friend. That's, that's how Moses knew what happened in Genesis 1, 2, 3, all the way through Genesis and Exodus, right? Some of it may have been passed down orally, but a lot of that information he got from God. Um, Luke, obviously, we already talked about. How did he get the information for the book of Luke? He investigated. He interviewed eyewitnesses. Okay, he probably interviewed Mary, you know, Jesus's mom, right? I mean, he interviewed lots of people, and we could see that kind of in the in the book. Um, sometimes, like there would be someone that, like for example, in First Corinthians, Paul says it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you. Like someone came and told Paul some stuff, right? And that's part of what he's addressing. Or in Corinthians, you'll often say he says now concerning food sacrificed idols, now concerning these different things. Well, guess what? Those were questions that they asked him that he's writing to answer their questions, right? So there's, there's some background of like why he's saying these things. Um, I, I will also say a lot of times, this will get this into a later point, but how a lot of the information that the author will have will be based on previous scripture, right? So they'll know you know, you could assume Paul knows the Old Testament. You could assume that Isaiah knows the Torah. You could, you see what I'm saying? So obviously, Isaiah, when he wrote the book of Isaiah, obviously he hadn't read Matthew, right? He wasn't born yet, right? Jesus wasn't born yet. But Isaiah had read all the scripture that came before him. And in that sense, we talked about last semester, the, the principle of progressive revelation. So the Torah comes first, and pretty much everything gets built on that. And then the New Testament is built on the Old Testament. And so you could assume that whatever scripture came before an author, they had read, they had interacted with. 
Um, the New Testament was all written in such a short time, it's hard to know which authors may have read other authors, but I could, we could say probably the only clear one is the Apostle John. He wrote all of his letters, his gospel, and the book of Revelation around 90 AD, right? So that's well after all the others. So he had read probably all the rest of the New Testament, at least the other gospels. And there's evidence in the gospel of John that he wrote the gospel of John because he had read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and he knew that they were similar, and he wanted to include stories that they didn't include, that he, as one of the original 12, knew about, right? And so he just has a different flavor than the other Gospels who kind of probably copied off of each other a little bit. It, it, there's debate about which Gospel was first. I think Matthew, some people think Mark. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that right now. But... Um, John was definitely written later, and he's like, I'm not going to include the same stories. So there's a lot in John that's original to John. You with me? All right. Um, and then, of course, the all-important question, why did the author write the book? Okay, so this is all, once again, this is all general background information. Who wrote? Who did he write it to? You know, but now the big question, why did he write? What's the motive? What was he trying to accomplish in the lives of the hearers? So... The Torah, Israel's on the brink of the promised land, and he's writing to what? Simply put, you could say the point of the Torah is trust and obey, right? Who's your God? Know him. He's faithful. He's good. He's trustworthy, right? So you could trust him. You can obey him. You can take the promised land, right? Know your mission, your purpose, your identity, who you are. You were created in the image of God to, to live in relationship with him. So the author is writing to them to you know, that they may go in and take possession of the land and, and do all that Moses said. First Corinthians, right? Paul received this letter from Chloe. Um, we already talked about that. So he's writing to confront different issues that he heard about, division and questions. And, and that's kind of the immediate. We talked about Hebrews already. They're tempted to renounce Christ. And so he's, in, he's writing the purposes to encourage them to hold fast to Christ. Um. First John, we already talked about, right? False teachers leading people away from the church. He's writing to, really the point of First John is this is how you can know that you're a believer, right? Because they're questioning, right? These false teachers came in, people have left the church. And so they're like, well, wait a minute. Are they the real Christians or are we like, wait a minute, or what they're saying is true? And he's like, no, here's the gospel. Here's what it means to be a Christian. That's why the book of First John is a great book to take a brand new Christian through. Because he's really saying, this is what Christianity is. Here's the fundamentals of the faith so that you can be sure you know God. Does that make sense? That's his purpose. I want you to have assurance. I've written these things so that you may know, you know, that you know God in essence. Um, all right, so that's the general context. There's a lot there. That's probably, that's probably the most significant. It's one of the most significant parts, like, what's the occasion for writing, you could say? Who wrote to whom? Why, is they, why are they writing? Any questions about that? I just, I just had a comment or a thought. Like, it's so encouraging to, when you do this process, seeing that it's not at random. Yeah. Like, there's an audience, there's people, it's addressed to you know, specific, specific things. And so, yeah, it's just like when you, when you share, when we share the gospel or even... For us, as we read, like, wow, it's so beautiful that it's not just random. Like, there's history, there's archaeology. There's just different things that people can see um, that this is not a random thing. It, yeah. has, a lot, it has a beauty, you know, and, and God for purpose so we can get to know him. So. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Eddie. All right, so now the, the historical cultural background. Now, I'll say this, this is important at some level. It's probably not as important. This can often just be the kind of the the color, the flavor of the text, right? And, and so I'll, I'll give some different examples, but and I'll probably go a little bit quicker through this one. So what was going on in the world at the time? What nation was in power? So um, I'll give you an example from Isaiah 39, right? At that time, Merodach Baladon, the son of Baladon, the king of Babylon, sent, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah. Okay, so who's Who's the major world power at this time? Anyone know? It's not Babylon. It's Assyria. Good. 
So Assyria, you know, is the one that, you know, you remember the whole story. They surrounded and Hezekiah, you know, gets on his knees and prays and the angel of Yahweh defeats the, the Assyrian army. Babylon at this time, they're a kingdom, but they're not a major world power yet, right? And so when they send envoys to Hezekiah, he's like, they're not a threat. They're just this other kingdom. And he starts showing off his treasuries and everything. And, but, but you have, it's, it's to understand what's going on here, you have to understand a little bit like, oh, Assyria's the major world power. So Hezekiah is kind of wanting to buddy, buddy up with anybody who's against Assyria, you know, and that's Babylon at this time. He see, he's viewing them more as kind of like an ally and a friend. Whereas later, what happens in this passage, he shows them his whole treasuries. Well, a couple hundred years later, they're going to come in and just ad- utterly destroy Jerusalem, right? So, but it's, he's currying the favor of Babylon, to your point, Pat, rather than God, rather than trusting God. He's kind of, he's playing a little politics here. He's buddy-buddying a bit, right? And so, once again, it's just helpful. You don't necessarily need to know all that to know what's going on in this chapter, but it's pretty helpful to see what's going on. Does that make sense? Um. You know, what wars were going on? Isaiah 7, right? In the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it. You're like, what is going on? <laughs> All these people. And so, you know, you just got to kind of understand a little bit of the context, right? So in the days of Ahaz, so Ahaz is the king of the southern kingdom, Judah, right? Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem. So Ahaz is the king of the south. You with me? Then you have the king of the north and the king of Syria, which is another kingdom. Those two countries had allied together. And who are they? They're also allying with who? Assyria, right? Because Assyria is the, this, this is before you know, Isaiah 39, when the 37, 38, 39, when the Babylonians get destroyed, right? So I mean, when the, sorry, when the Assyria, I'm getting mixing myself up, when the Assyrians get destroyed, right? So Israel and Syria, they align themselves with Assyria because they're these little nations. So you could put it like this, Israel and Syria are the, the big dogs on the park, but Assyria is the lion. And Judah's the little dog. You with me? So the, the two kind of bigger bo- dogs are like, we're going to the lion side, right? And so they align. They're all now aligned with Assyria, and they're coming against Judah, right? And then Ahaz, he's this wicked king, and he's like terrified, right? Because not only does he have Israel, the northern kingdom, not only does he have Assyria, I mean Syria, but he also has Assyria all attacking him, Right? And so he's shaking like a, I mean, his knees start knocking, the text says. And there's just this great text in Isaiah, you know, Isaiah 7, where Isaiah is like, hey, if you don't trust me, who are you going to trust? You know, and it's this powerful kind of, you know, text. And then there's the prophecy of the virgin birth. But I mean, there's, there's just a lot of context there. Once again, we're, we can't preach every book of the Bible in this class, but um, there's just so much good, good history, like, oh, who are these different nations? Who are they allying with? Who's the big dog? Who's the lion? You know, how do people relate to the major world power at the time, right? Even like if, if anything's going on in our world politically, right, the U.S. of A., like just knowing this history, we've been the major world power for, I don't know, 70 years at least, like the predominant superpower, but then you got Russia and China and you know, maybe we're a little bit on the decline and, and China's rising and, and Russia's declining, but they still got nuclear weapons. And I mean, there's all these dynamics, right? And that history, you know, if, if, if we're talking about kings and kingdoms, that's all relevant, isn't it? So all those types of things were going on in the ancient world as well. Once again, you don't have to be an expert in all of it. I'm not saying that, but these are just, if you're reading a passage, these are just little questions and notes and obs- we're noticing things, aren't we? Wait a minute, who's this country? Who's this country? Who's in power? Just start taking notes. Um, which world powers are rising or falling? Um, so in Second Kings, Josiah, right, he does what? He goes up to the king of Assyria, right? And King Josiah went with him. Pharaoh Necha killed him at Megiddo. So this is, I mean, this is kind of interesting. It, I mean, so many of these texts, right? 
I mean, I'm not even getting into it, but you have Egypt, who at this point isn't a major world power, and so, but they are trying to oppose Babylon. <laughs> it's like, you know, so it's like, which side are you going to pick in this Babylon versus Assyria? And you could read about, like even in world history, how the Babylonians get defeated or how they take over the Assyrians and how the Egyptians, when they realize the uh, the Babylonians are rising to power, they start siding with the um, Assyrians against the Ba- Babylonians, and so then Josiah gets himself into the mix and s- tries to stop Egypt from going to help Assyria fight against Babylon. Well, you don't need to know all that necessarily, but that's what's going on in the world, okay? And and sometimes that becomes relevant for particular passages, okay? Um, who are important people? Like, are there kings? Are there governors? You know, are there officials in in our passage? Another key question, how do the recipients relate to Israel as a nation? What was Israel as a nation like? Um, So, you know, is Israel, is this before the divided kingdom? Is this after? Is this the northern kingdom? Is this the southern kingdom? Are we talking about in the New Testament? We're talking about Jewish Christians. Are we talking, you know, you see what I'm saying? Like the nation of Israel is God's chosen people. And so a lot of the Bible revolves around God's plan for them and then how that translates into his plan for the church and ultimately at the end to save Israel and reunite us all in the church. And so um, how do we, re- how, what's going on with Israel? Who's being, who are these books being written to? Like, for example, even um, the book of Nahum is an interesting book. You want to know who Nahum is? written to we can pull it up um let me see oh, where is it here i lost it oh here it is um there we go all right so nahum one you can look at it the oracle of nineveh the book of the vision of nahum the elkishite a jealous and and the whole book is against who? Assyria. And it's almost like the book was written to Assyria. But really, no book of the Bible was written to foreign nations. They're all written to Israel. So Nahum's just an interesting book because it's it's like it's written to it's written against Assyria, but it's really written to God's people to encourage them that God will ultimately triumph. Okay, so once again, I'm not gonna get through all of Nahum, but um Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And so you just see, you know, God going against them. Um, anyway, so who, who, who do, how do the recipients of the book relate to the nation of Israel? And then was this book written to Israel as a whole or a subset within Israel or the church? So a lot of the, the prophetic books, like all the different prophets, even Samuel King's, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, these were all written to the nation of Israel as a whole and calling the nation to repent. But books like the wisdom literature, like the Psalms and the Proverbs, they're almost more written to the righteous within the nation. Like, how do you as an individual live rightly with God? Does that make sense? So the prophetic books are like, Israel, you need to repent. Now, that doesn't mean there's not relevance for individuals within the nation, but the audience was more the nation as the prophet called the nation of Israel to repentance. But some of the writings like Ruth, like Song of Solomon, Psalms and Proverbs, um, Ezra, Nehemiah, Chronicles, these books were more written to encourage righteous people within the nation. Okay, so, you know, just kind of keeping in mind, like, is this, Uh, Is the audience of this the nation of Israel as a whole or more like the righteous within the nation? And then where do we find ourselves within redemptive history? We'll we'll come back to that, but, you know, where are we in the storyline? Okay, so that's all um, kind of what's going on in the world. What about the physical geography of the area? That's always a fun one, right? I mean, um, you know, pulling out maps and just kind of seeing what's going on. Um, you know, geography is really interesting for battles. Like if you look at the battle of David and Goliath, 
you'll find out like the whole battle occurs in the Elah Valley and the Philistines are on one side of the valley and the Israelites on the other and they station themselves because this valley, I mean, if you look at the geography as Israel, the Philistines lived on the coastal plain and the Israelites lived up in the hills and there's these valleys that go down from the hills down to the coast. And so they find themselves in one of these valleys and they're kind of encamped on either side and they're camped in such a way that if they lose, they could both run home right? Now, now, do you need to know that necessarily to understand the battle of David and Goliath? No, but it just kind of gives some color and some flavor, like to these, like the Israelites and the Philistines kept going back and forth, up and down these valleys, fighting each other, doing raids on each other's territories and things. And now there's this battle right in the middle as they've kind of like met in the middle and they're battling it out. Okay. So that's just kind of the context there. Um, You know, judges, you got the whole story of Deborah and Barak and Sisera. Well, Sisera's got these 900 iron chariots, and so Barak takes all his people up Mount Tabor. Well, guess where chariots can't go? Up the mountain, right? And so, I mean, it's just kind of interesting for the battle to see, like, the strategies that were involved. I mean, you could kind of geek out on that stuff. You don't necessarily need to understand all of this to understand what's going on in the passage. I mean, it can just kind of be some, some flavor, some context to understand what's going on. Right. Because to be honest, some of these things can be confusing, can't they? Like what's going on in this passage? And sometimes just a little bit of this background is like, oh, I see there's this battle. People are, you know, we could kind of, you know, if you're really studying, if you're just reading a passage just to read, that's fine. You don't have to understand everything to get things out of the word of God. But if you're like really studying this passage, you're going to teach on it or you're just doing your devotions. You really want to meditate on this passage. These are the things we want to look for to kind of give us some context. All right. Was the area primarily Jewish or Gentile, right? So in the gospels, right? You know, Jerusalem was heavily Jewish. Obviously, Galilee was a lot more Gentile. And then the east side of the of Ga- the Sea of Galilee, that was thoroughly Gentile. So at different times, even in the Gospels, Jesus is in more Jewish areas. He's in more Gentile areas, right? I mean, in Mark 7, right, the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, right? And you could kind of, uh, you know, get the whole context at, at different times or even... Um, even with Elijah and Elisha, you, you have them going to Tyre and Sidon. Anyone know where those cities are at? They're on the coast above Israel, right? So that's with outside of the land of Israel. So you get some different interactions there. We're like, wait, he's going to the Gentiles. He's leaving, you know, different Elijah and Elisha at various times flee from kings trying to kill them. They'll leave Israel, go to the Gentiles, I mean, ministering to the Gentiles. Yeah. Oh, just, I was going to finish it off, but like, uh knowing you know like the location and then just what 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 location is gentile and what location is is, is jewish because I think it was luke where jesus says uh, had i gone had i gone to or had this message been preached to tyre and sidon yeah. you know they would have repented yeah and so kind of comparing like the, the people of israel and, and using like the gentiles to shame them in terms of like like, I'll go to the Gentiles, and they will repent, but you, my own people, like, are not listening to me. Yeah. Um, and then just in the Old Testament where, like, uh, in Isaiah 1, where he compares uh, Israel to Sodom and Gomorrah. So just knowing that Sodom and Gomorrah is, you know, obviously knowing the history of them, but that it's a... And even, like, in the New Testament, they talk about, like, Sodom and Gomorrah will be able to stand in judgment, you know, you know, or they'll be able to stand in judgment over like the, the Jewish people. Not not those words exactly, but this comparison of like right. putting the Gentile nations above the people of Israel because of their <laughs> unwillingness to hear. Like even the Gentiles will hear this message and they'll repent, but you guys aren't. And so yeah, like the value of just knowing, okay, the city that he just mentioned in this analogy, like just knowing that he's talking about like the Gentile city, just the history of that, that city in the Bible, like, helps to understand the point he's trying to make. So just to get to agree, and, like, from my personal experience in reading it, that, yeah, that, knowing that stuff is super helpful. Yeah. I mean, you got the Samaritan woman. I don't know if I have that example. Yeah. John 4, right? Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Who are the Samaritans? Like, I mean, these are maybe some of the more obvious ones. Maybe most most of us or many of us know about the Samaritans, like this, quote-unquote, that the Jews thought of the Samaritans as half-breed, right? That was their mentality because they're part Jewish, part Gentile. They actually, I don't know if you knew this, but the Samaritans actually had 
their own worship system. You know, they didn't worship at the temple. They worshiped on their mountain. They had, actually, they didn't believe in the whole Old Testament. They have what's called the Samaritan Pentateuch. So they had their version of the Torah, right? Where they ripped out all the stuff about Jerusalem. They pulled all that stuff out and then they had their own Torah, right? So the Jews are like, you guys distorted the word of God. You're half breeds. You're mixed in with the Gentiles. You're not worshiping in Jerusalem. You're obviously, but they, it's not like the Samaritans were just pagans, right? They, they tried to worship God, but they kind of had their own way of doing it, right? And so there's some sense in which the Jews were right. They weren't doing it right. But then of course, the Jews were very proud about that. And so even within that, right, if you look at the, in the Gospels, right, who are some of Jesus' main enemies? The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, guess where most of them were located? In Jerusalem. So even when he gets, starts going into Galilee, he's, it's, it's Jewish, but it's not as Jewish as Jerusalem. And you don't have like this religious elite up in Galilee like you did. So, you know, once again, just reading through the Gospels, just kind of some of that geography, right, helps you to understand what's going on. Oh, Jesus is coming to Jerusalem now. Now he's coming toe-to-toe with the Pharisees. He might have an interaction with them in the north, but that's kind of like out of their home court, right? And then you got the Jew. So, once again, you don't have to know all that, but certainly if you're going to understand John 4, you got to understand who are the Samaritans, and why is Jesus talking to this woman like this? And, I mean, it's hugely relevant in certain passages, right? Um, here's another one. What language was spoken, right? So, you got these different areas and groups, so they don't, they're not always speaking the same language, right? Jews are speaking Hebrew in the Old Testament, But in the New Testament times, the Jews are speaking Aramaic, but the world at large was speaking Greek, right? Greece was the lingua franca at the time of the New Testament. And then in the Old Testament, right, you you have for the most part, if you're in Israel, you're speaking Hebrew, but what did most of the other nations speak? Well, all the world powers pretty much spoke Aramaic, right? So you just got different languages. And so sometimes that comes into play, right, in Isaiah 36, when the Assyrians come and they're sieging Hezekiah, right? What do, the, what do Hezekiah's men say? Hey, stop speaking to us in our own dialect because we don't want you to scare the people on the wall. And Rob Shekha, right, the commander of the Assyrian army is like, hey, you're not going to be the only ones that drink your own urine and eat your own dung. I'm going to speak in the language that all the people can hear. But they're like, hey, no, speak to us in Aramaic. We can understand. He's like, nope, I'm speaking in Hebrew and I'm going to terrify all y'all, you know, because that's my job right? So there's different languages going on there. Here's a really interesting one. In Psalm 2, there's one word in Psalm 2 in Aramaic. It's the word son, right? And if you, if you read all of Psalm 2, I didn't put the whole context there, but the, the final stanza is to the nations, right? And it's really, hey, kings of the earth, submit yourself to the king of Israel, right? You with me? right? And so he says, kiss the son, and he uses Aramaic. He uses the language of the nations for the word son instead of the Hebrew word for son, right? So, uh, you know, it's, it's, he's basically saying, hey, I'm speaking to you nations, like submit yourself to the true king of the earth, which is the Jewish king. So there's kind of an interesting kind of like he throws in a different language there. Or in the book of Daniel, I don't know if you know this, it's pretty much the only book of the Bible that's written in two different languages. Half the book is written in Hebrew and half the book is written in Aramaic. And Hebrew and Aramaic are kind of sister languages, but they're totally different languages. And it, I mean, if you're going to really study Daniel, the book of Daniel in depth, the Hebrew part of the book was written more Well, Daniel talks about the times of the Gentiles, and so much of the book of Daniel is about the fact that God is sovereign even over the Gentile nations, because so much of the book is about what? The Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans, and all these prophecies, and how God is sovereign over all the nations, okay? So um, the, the beginning and the end of the book are written in Hebrew, that are more like emphasizing God's kingdom and God's rule. And anyway, I don't have time to do the whole book of Daniel here, but um, it's interesting how Daniel brings in the two different languages to emphasize like the language of the world versus the language of the Jews. And he uses that as part of his structure to the book. Very, very fascinating. 
Um, but you would want to know that if you're going to like study the book of Daniel in depth. Um, what kind of land was it? I mean, this is kind of interesting. You got deserts, you got, you know, forests, you have so many different areas, right? And so, you know, when you hear the glory of Lebanon, what's the glory of Lebanon? Like, what, do you know, did anyone know anything about Lebanon? Yeah. See, there's cedar trees. Cedar trees. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. Like, I use that as an apologetic. Their flag has a tree on it. And so all, all throughout the Old Testament, when it talks about Lebanon, it refers to their trees. I mean, this is my answer. I don't know if it's right. Yeah. And uh, I have a friend who's, uh, who's Lebanese. And so one day I just, you know, she posted something like with a flag. I'm like, oh, wow. That's a, that's a tree on the flag. So they must be known for their trees. And the Bible talked about how great their trees were. Yeah, yeah. And so but that, that's my answer. Yeah, exactly, right? So I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of Israel. I mean, they've, I mean there's a lot of desert, right? And there are farmlands, but it's kind of arid, right? So it's not known for forests. There weren't too many forests in Israel, but just to the north of them, you got Mount Hermon and you got Lebanon, you got the cedars of Lebanon and forests and trees. And so, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes they'll talk about the glory of Lebanon and, you know, and, and the majesty of Carmel. It's just different kinds of geography being talked about. I mean, even in Amos, <laughs> it's kind of uh, sad, but like he's confronting some of the women and he says, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria. And he's talking, he's rebuking some women who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, right? Well, what's Bashan? Well, Bashan is the area, we would call it the Golan Heights today. It's the area kind of, once again, it's, it's still in Israel, but it's kind of on the border with Lebanon. And so it's a very lush area in Israel. Like there's not a lot of like really green, lush areas. And so he's, he's I mean, Amos here is talking to some women and he's like, you're, you know, you're like these fat cows of Bashan, right? The, the cows in Bashan, you know, had plenty of green grass to eat. They were, you know, they were lush, fat cows, so to speak. And he's like insulting, you know, once again, you don't have to understand that insult to understand all of Amos, but, you know, kind of like, what is he talking about Bashan? What's that? You know, um, all right. And then what other kind of just like history context are there other places? So Obadiah, you know, the book of Obadiah, there was a recent attack on Israel that is kind of the context for the book. Um, and the attack was on Israel and Obadiah is written to Edom, which was a brother nation to Israel. And when the, the attack came on Israel, their brothers like Edom's like, all right, this is just like an opportunity for us. Like when the big, when the lion comes in, the little dog comes in to eat up all the scraps. And so this book of Obadiah is written to Edom to say, like, how dare you when Israel's at its lowest and they're being attacked by this massive nation and you're like rejoicing over their downfall. That's kind of the context of Obadiah. Uh, just the wickedness, like you're a brother nation. I mean, Ezekiel, obviously the Babylonian, I mean, so many of the books, the Babylonian invasion, right? But um, you could see Ezekiel 24 is kind of the hinge of the book when he says, son of man, write down the name of this day, this very day, the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. And that's like kind of a hinge in the book where the siege on Jerusalem begins. The whole book is kind of like turning on that hinge. Uh, I'm not going to get into Ezekiel right now, but... um, Philippi. So obviously Paul wrote all these different letters to all these different cities, right? Well, what's significant about Philippi is that they were actually a Roman colony. You could go back and and read the history of the city of Philippi. It was founded. There was a bunch of battles and things that happened there. But after one big battle, the emperor let a bunch of his Roman generals retire in Philippi. And so Philippi, even though it's not in Italy, right? It had a very Roman feel to it. And a lot of the people of Philippi were proud of their Roman citizenship. So that comes in, in the book of Philippians, right? He talks about uh, our citizenship is in heaven, right? Because he's writing to people who are proud of their Roman citizenship. Um, Corinth, we already talked about some of the problems with Corinthians. Well, part of it has to do with their geography. And they were like this important port city and you know, we kind of talk, it's kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a stereotype, right? Sailors, right? Are 
drink a lot and women and all that kind of stuff. Well, that, that's kind of even from ancient times, like this port city. So it was known for being a licentious city. Right? And so there's a lot in Corinthians about sexual immorality, isn't there? I mean, 5 1, 7 1, they're, they're writing a lot of questions about sexual immorality, and he's dealing with that. Well, it fits with kind of the context of Corinth and what they were. I mean, there was just tons of cult prostitutes in Corinth and all kinds of stuff like that that was unique to that city that other New Testament cities didn't have as much of an emphasis. Right? So that's just kind of background to these letters. All right, cultural background. I'm going to fly through these quickly and we'll take a break. So what was a meal like? Obviously, in the the Last Supper, they weren't sitting at tables like this, were they? Right now, you don't need to know that. But what is Peter? He saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, reclining at table. Well, that's because they're, they're eating on the floor, basically, right? They're all lounging. They have pillows. Well, that's how, that's how they ate meals. So, like, if you're picturing, you know, uh, the, last, the painting, the Last Supper with all the disciples sitting at the table, right? That's, that's probably what most of us think of, like, oh, the Last Supper, right? No, that's not what it looked like, right? And so then it's like, well, wait a minute. If they're all sitting at tables and chairs, how is John leaning on Jesus, you know, and whispering back and forth with each other? Once again, you don't need to know that, but it's like all of a sudden, if you know, oh, they weren't sitting at a table, this verse all of a sudden makes sense, doesn't it? Oh, they're lounging, they're sitting on pillows, John, they're kind of reclining and talking to each other. It's like, okay, something that was kind of confusing all of a sudden just makes sense. Um, Well, slavery, obviously slavery is all throughout the Bible. What was slavery like? I mean, um, you know, Paul and Timothy, they call themselves slaves of Christ Jesus. What does he mean by that? Philemon, right? God, Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon, who was his runaway slave. And I'm just understanding, or you're talking about bonds, you know, there's just a ton of background. There's a lot in the Bible about slavery, Egyptian slavery. You know, there's a, there's a lot to study throughout that and how that kind of understands our meaning of that word. Okay, what was warfare like? I love this one, right? Going back to David and Goliath. Goliath, when it describes his armor and everything, I mean, he's got this helmet and shield and armor and all this stuff. Well, actually, I mean, this, I could geek out on this. It's actually kind of like Greek armor. And the Philistines actually have a Greek origin. You could, you could study that. It's pretty interesting. But I mean, just like even the different types of weapons and things he has are very Greek in nature. I, I'm not going to get into that. But um, there's all kinds of stuff about warfare. And then I'm just going to list different, kind of things that you could be looking for, like political background is citizenship, religious, you have food sacrificed to idols, you have a, boy, a goat boiled in its mother's milk, we talked about that, economic, you know, what's a talent, what's a denarii, what's a double portion, what's an inheritance, in agriculture, what's chaff, what's olive trees, right, uh, architecture, what's a roof like, what's the temple like, What does it mean in clothing to gird up your loins and different kinds of crowns? Uh, Medical, what does it mean to anoint with oil? Geographical, I mean, this is a great one, like the Jordan River Valley, right? We talk about the Trans-Jordan. There's two and a half tribes on the other side of the Jordan. That's hugely relevant for the book of Joshua. We already talked about Samaria. Okay, so, um, you know, military backgrounds, why in judges you got these left-handed slingers why does it mention that well because they were actually like elite warriors because siege ramps were always go counterclockwise up a city so that if you're f- defending the city and you're right-handed you got a full swing but if if you're attacking and going up the wall and you're right-handed you're you're up against that wall and it's kind of awkward to try to fight your way up so they designed their cities to be easily defended you know, and not easily attacked. Well, if you're going to go up the siege ramp that's going, well, I guess, count uh, clockwise up, then you want left-handed slingers because they got that full swing to go attack up there. Anyway, just it, there's just these different backgrounds. So when it says left-handed men, these guys are like the Navy SEALs going into attack. Okay, so anyway, um, let me let me end our kind of historical cultural background with this. We, as much as all this stuff can be helpful in just kind of understanding the context and the background, we do want to beware of what's called mirror reading. And that is this idea that 
whatever the author says always has something to do with a specific situation in the audience. So the point, we already kind of mentioned this, but the point is this. If, let's say you're reading a commentary or you're reading some background, you're reading your study Bible, and you're reading some background information. If that sheds light on the text, if that makes it easier to understand, right, then that's helpful, right? But if it makes the text more convoluted and it makes it harder to understand, the, the goal of this background is to make it easier to understand what the text is saying. And sometimes people can say, oh, this is, the, or maybe you're hearing on, on YouTube or your favorite preacher, or, or maybe you're not favorite preacher, or you're just hearing someone say something, right? And they're bringing in this background. Well, sometimes you could, they could almost use that background to override the text, right? And we're saying this is all helpful, but it's, it's not the text, Okay, and it's kind of, it's giving a setting. If, it, if that setting is making the text more clear and helps you understand, oh, now the text makes sense, it's clear, it's just kind of clarifying some things, that's helpful. But if it's distracting us and taking us away from them, the meaning of the text, now it's taking us off in another direction. Okay, so, and, and I want to say this as well. Sometimes pastors, preachers, teachers, commentaries, whatever, you know, they'll say, oh, this is the background. This is the setting. And sometimes it's obvious and you're like, oh yeah, I could see that. But sometimes even the background has to be interpreted itself. You with me? And so it's not inspired. The text is inspired. So I'm just saying we just, that's just kind of a word of caution here. So if someone says, here's the background and it's changing the meaning of the text, you're like, I thought the text was pretty clearly meaning this. And they're saying, oh, it doesn't mean that because of all this. I would just say be very wary. Like the text is what's inspired. The background and the culture, this stuff is all great. We we can kind of learn and and hopefully it's coloring the text for us and just kind of helping us to understand it in context. But if it's like changing the meaning, I would say be very cautious about that. Don't just take someone's word for like, oh, yeah, yeah. Paul wrote Philippians. Oh, this is a common one. Uh, Paul wrote Philippians to deal with this emperor cult, and I could go get into the whole theory of it, but it kind of changes the whole meaning of the book of Philippians. Um, and I'm like, no, that doesn't really help us here. Yeah, and you're, you're kind of like, I guess I'll put it this way. You talked about the meta narrative. You're, you're, you're looking big picture, it can make sense, but then when you read the individual verses, it doesn't fit into that. It just doesn't work. Yeah, I think one, one example that I, I um, even like, the, one example that, I, that I've heard recently of, 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 of this is uh, when it comes to the Timothy about, about uh, women, women have authority in teaching. There are the, the, they're people who use like something that was going on culturally. I think it was like uh, like some form of feminism or something. Yeah. And they would use that to say Paul was addressing like that verse or those, that passage has nothing to do with us today because Paul was addressing a specific issue that had to do with a specific thing happening in feminism in that area. Right. And so in that context, that's what he's talking about. But since we're not in that situation now, it doesn't apply to right. us. That's yeah, that's a that's a great example, Pat. That's a classic example. Even what's interesting there is, as Paul is saying, I don't allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Is the passage you're referring to, right? Then he says for, and he grounds that command in some reasons. He says for it was not Adam who was deceived, but Eve, being fully deceived, fell into transgression. Well, actually, before that, he says, but actually, Adam was created first and not Eve. And then, and, and then, so he grounds his reasons for that command in Genesis 1 and in Genesis, well, actually in Genesis 2 and in Genesis 3. So he's grounding why you should do this in creation order, not in a cultural situation, right? So that would be a perfect example where it's like, oh, Paul's just dealing with some feminists and that's why he's saying, and so as long as you don't have feminists, it's okay for women to teach. Well, that, wait a minute, that's not what Paul says, isn't it? Paul grounds what he says in creation order, and, and that argument doesn't help you make sense of the text, does it? It confuses it. Well, wait a minute. If 
he's saying don't teach because of feminists. Why doesn't he say don't teach because of feminists, right? He says don't teach because of creation order, right? So that supposed background doesn't clarify the text. It only makes it more confusing. And, that, and Paul's argument now is completely incomprehensible. So that's a great example. And I love this quote uh, from a guy named Andy Nacelli. He's a great uh, Bible teacher. He says, historical cultural context does not eliminate the text. It illuminates the text. So that, that's my main point. If some of this background kind of sheds some light and like, oh, I see the context. I see what's going on. Now it makes sense. Great. But if it's eliminating the text, we've gotten it wrong. So I'll say this as well. Often the, the historical cultural background, they're not absolutely vital to interpret the text, right? But they often kind of give us some understanding. Like even just using that example of John 21, do you have to know that the disciples weren't sitting at a table to, to interpret John 21 correctly? No. But it just kind of gives us a little bit of the flavor. It makes like, oh, that means this little thing, John leaning on Jesus's breast. Like, oh, it makes sense now. It gives us kind of like the cultural background. It helps us to see a little bit. But it's not like you can't understand the point of John 21 without that. And so often I think that's kind of what historical cultural background does. It's, it's helpful. It helps us to kind of like, it clarifies some things. It makes it make more sense. But it's not necessarily vital. There's, there's sometimes it can be really vital, you know, but that's more on the rare side. And so it's more just like, I, I don't want to overemphasize this, but I think it's just kind of like, oh, as we're studying our Bibles, it's just kind of shedding some light on some of the, the corner areas of the text. 